Okay. Can anyone pray for us? Okay. Um, Balin Solomon, let's pray. Thank you, okay. Father. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you, Father, for this time that we are going to discuss uh, issues hearing from the presenters. With put them in you, them into your hands, and may all this that will be displayed and taught benefit all the people attending and be extended in the future. In this name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Solomon, for the very uh, very powerful prayer. So. As a way of introduction, uh, our hosts today are Busoga Health Forum, uh, which is an association of like-minded people and professionals that are stimulating community, government, and partner associations actions for better health of the people of Busoga. We are a national, not-for-profit, uh, voluntary membership-based organization that has its headquarters at the heart of Busoga in Ginger City. Busoga Health Forum works in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, local government, and civil society organizations to coordinate health interventions through established technical working groups and technical or administrative structures that include the district health teams and formal and non-formal community structures, as well as academic uh, institutions like Macquarie University. So the Health Forum is there for a think tank, generating evidence to drive health policy action to improve the health and development of individuals in Busoga and beyond. And that is why we are all here today our vision is a healthy and thriving Busoga in all aspects. And uh, really the mission is to rally Busoga professionals from all dimensions to use evidence to engage community, government, partner action for better health of our children, youth, women, and men in Busoga. The core values are value addition, collaboration and integration, impact focus, transparency and accountability, and effectiveness and efficiency. <laughs> Our core programs are reproductive, maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health, malaria, HIV and TB, regional planning and data use, infectious and non-communicable diseases, and urban health, really the whole spectrum of, of the health uh, uh, diseases. You are all welcome to join the Busoga Health Forum, and you can contact uh, the Busoga Health Forum on, uh, on the contact given below. So thank you very much. Uh, you can scan that uh, QR code uh, to pay up your subscription and to uh, be a part of this forum. So as quickly, uh, we're go I'm going to introduce our speakers today uh, who are going to talk about uh, pregnancy and sickle cell disease. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Doug Gracious Monove, who is a consultant hematologist and oncologist at um, Lago National Referral Hospital and is an expert in sickle cell disease and has over 10 years experience in the care of uh, children and adult sickle cell disease, but also in training and research about sickle cell disease. Uh, you're welcome, Dr. Munube. Our next, our other presenter is Dr. Jacqueline Akello, who is an assistant lecturer at the uh, Macquarie University College of Health Sciences under the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She has uh, expertise in uh, the care of pregnant women, but is currently uh, pursuing her PhD in uh, sickle cell disease. in pregnancy and uh, to help us answer some of our questions. Over to you, Dr. Mnobe. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Dr. Namazi, and good evening, colleagues, and thank the Busoga Health Forum for hosting this important webinar on sickle cell disease and pregnancy. As Dr. Namazi had mentioned, my name is Dr. Deo Gracias Munubi. I'm a pediatrician, and I'm sure many of you would be wondering why should a pediatrician be discussing pregnancy-related as aspects. We have had a very interesting aspect when it comes to people living with sickle cell disease. They have grown up in pediatric clinics, and they tend to stay there. And that is why when they are pregnant, we must engage the obstetrician, and this is where Dr. Akello will come in and give most of the discussion. My role here is to really uh, share with you, the people on the webinar, 
some of the key policy aspects when it comes to sickle cell disease. And I'll just extract a chapter from the Uganda Management Guidelines so that we're all aware that it's something that the Ministry of Health has in plan, but we need to implement it. Thank you. I'll be sharing my slides shortly. So most of you or some of you might be aware that there are national guidelines for the management and prevention of sickle cell disease that were launched by the Ministry of Health during the COVID time. And just to highlight, there are several objectives, but one key objective is to provide a guide on the management of pregnancy in sickle cell disease as one of the key aspects of the management guideline. And you will see in chapter six of that guideline, there's a whole chapter that is that is put in for pregnancy in sickle cell disease. And if I'm to just share some of the aspects and you will see more and more of this as Dr. Okello is presenting, it really focuses on a few aspects. One, what are some of the complications related to pregnancy in sickle cell disease? What are what are the aspects of preconception? Of course, this is for the future. Prenatal screening, which can be done now. Booking and antenatal care. What happens in labor? What are the aspects of people or mothers with sickle cell disease with regard to cesarean section? Because sometimes there are questions that can they go into normal labor or not. Postpartum care and contraception and this contraception can be both natural and artificial another key thing and why we're engaging members and healthcare workers because there's a key aspect of community involvement for us to be able to keep these mothers alive when they have sickle cell disease and pregnancy it involves all of us to work together and this is a community of healthcare workers so from the doctors etc and many others it will be very, very important for us to work together so that we do not lose these mothers when they become pregnant or they do not lose the babies during the time of pregnancy and they have good outcomes. So if you look specifically, I had mentioned chapter six, but there's also chapter seven which looks at prevention. And for future, this is something that we really have to engage in. So how can we ensure that there is uh, premarital screening so that we can reduce the number of people who are born with sickle cell disease? And if you have sickle cell disease, is it possible for you to do preconceptual screening? Because there's genetic counseling that tells you the risk at which you may have a child with sickle cell disease, but there's also preconceptual screening. So we are not saying don't marry someone who you're in love with who may have a gene, but you should be able to make a, an informed uh, decision when you're doing so. Uh, the last part I would want to highlight is really the, the role of the community, our referral system. Let us as healthcare workers not be afraid to refer because that is the only way you can improve care. And then of course, looking at the guidelines and looking at how important they are when it comes to improving maternal and child health. And these are some key aspects I wanted to share. Um, Dr. Akello, I'm going to stop sharing now and then invite you to please introduce yourself and take us through the main aspect of our talk. And then I'll be back to answer any questions and comments at the end. But also colleagues, you are allowed to type questions into the chat because usually you know how big the attendance is. We can actually answer questions on the go. So Jacqueline, you're welcome to share your slides and then we go into the meat of this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Munube, and thank you, uh, Dr. Ruth, for the introduction. Thank you, Busoga Health Forum, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, a bit of, it's going to be a discussion, uh, what we have about fecal cell disease in pregnancy. Yeah. Let me just screen share. So as already introduced, I'm uh, Jacqueline Akello, an obstetrician working with Makere University, currently pursuing, um, attempting to pursue a PhD in fecal cell disease in pregnancy, supported by Enrich. 
uh, which is really funding from uh, pediatric department. Uh, and I thank them for this opportunity. So to dive right through, Dr. Deogresh has already made uh, a bit of introduction about sickle cell disease, and I'm going to be specific to pregnancy because of the time limitations we have. Uh, so this is the outline of the presentation, basically a bit of introduction, preconception care, antenatal, intrapartum, and postnatal care. So when we look at the pathophysiology of uh, sickle cell disease in pregnancy, uh, we realize that the, the consequence of polymerization of the abnormal sickle cells, uh, especially the hemoglobin in low oxygen concentration, makes the uh, uh, plays a role in the complications we see in pregnancy a significant role, uh, and these complications are majorly anemia, vasoclusive crisis, painful crisis, but the complications can also be maternal and fetal, and you know all the maternal complications associated with pulmonary hypertension, renal dysfunction, uh, and then fetal complications of preterm birth and uh, increased perinatal morbidity and mortality, really. So, um, What's the problem we have with in, in Uganda? First of all, we don't have a documented prevalence of uh, pregnant women with sickle cell, but also we don't know the impact and determinants of pregnancy outcomes in our setting, we're not documented. Uh, Dr. Dale has already alluded to a guideline that is not in depth, and this is one area we need to work on. If you look at our current uh, Uganda essential maternal and newborn clinical care guidelines, I think there's just a phrase mentioned about sickle cell disease and uh, uh, anemia. So we don't have an in-depth uh, guideline as such. However, we note and acknowledge that the pediatric group have done a lot of work and many of our mothers, uh, I mean, many are surviving into adulthood, but then when they reach that level, uh, there's not much being done. Most of us can testify to how many of the doctors we lost just in a period of two months due to sickle cell even when they were not men, I mean women. So we have this call from the Lancet Hematology Commission of um, 2021, uh, and majorly to look at hematological, I mean, hema epidemiological data, improve access to treatment and come up with all these policies. So we, we need to focus on getting targeted in interventions in order to improve our outcomes. So when we talk about preconception care, when we talk about sickle cell disease in pregnancy, we really need to start from preconception care, we cannot overlook that. And, and Dr. Dale has alluded to this, the contraception, we need to look at the medications, completed vaccination program, crisis avoidance and genetic counseling for the couple. Like you said, we're not saying don't marry the partner, but uh, you should be counseled and ready to take the result and know the proportion of the children might be sicklers if you get a carrier and, and so on. And then we have to encourage the mothers that they should have a very low threshold for seeking medical help when they're pregnant. So just to go into a bit of detail about the preconception care, we need to talk to the, the, our mothers about the role of dehydration, coldness, hypoxia, overexertion, and the stress of pregnancy in increasing the risk of uh, painful crisis. Secondly, we know that the early trimesters are associated with nausea and vomiting, and this can result to dehydration and precipitate crisis, and they need to be informed in the preconception period. The risk of worsening anemia, the increased risk of crisis, chest syndrome, and all the other risks of infection need to be discussed in the preconception period. So the whole point is optimize the mother's condition before they get pregnant. And the chance, and also discuss the chance of uh, their baby being affected in case they have a partner who is uh, a carrier or also a sickle. And then you need an up to date assessment for chronic conditions, which we are going to look at shortly. So the chronic conditions you need to screen for in the preconception period, you need to screen the mother for pulmonary hypertension by doing an EEG if they've not had one in the past one year. Uh, secondly, you need to do blood pressure and urinalysis so that you rule out any renal disease and also hypertension. Uh, they also recommend, so most of this uh, really was from the ARCOG, that is the Royal, uh, the ARCOG guidelines, as well as a few of um, from the ECO guidelines as we try to put up uh, a guide um, management protocol. I, I need to make it clear that uh, Currently, we are working on a global protocol, but tailored to African setting. 
Uh, we've so far had three meetings, uh, but when that is out, we'll be able to share and have a contextualized protocol for Uganda or guideline that is uh, quite extensive. So you need to screen for iron overload. We of course know the effects of iron overload, especially for women who have had multiple transfusion, and this should be done in the preconception period. And if they are overloaded, then we need to do chelation before they conceive, uh, because we know iron overload is associated with adverse perinatal outcomes, but also the mother is at increased risk of oxidative stress, blood viscosity, and uh, inflammatory processes. We also screen preconceptually for red cell antibodies because this is associated with um, hemolytic disease of the newborn. So we need to do this in the preconception period. Still during the preconception period, we need to make sure they are uh, vac uh, vaccinated, both pneumococcal and completed. And then we are there on prof uh, penicillin prophylaxis. And if they were on NASCEIs, it should be stopped in the preconception period. And we start folic supplementation uh, for, for the reasons of neurotube defects, but also like every mother, but also we know the effect of folic for the sicklers. So if the mother has been on urea, um, hydroxyurea, sorry, it should be stopped at least three months prior to conception. But should she conceive, then you, you can cancel them, but you do not terminate the pregnancy. Okay. So that's about the preconception. In the antenatal care, uh, antenatal care must be by a multidisciplinary team, including an obstetrician with experience in high-risk pregnancies, and also a hematologist and, and all the other partners. Now, this was a heated discussion when we were doing the African protocol. Um, I know currently, as a country, we are looking at setting up high-risk clinics, and we're saying the, the high-risk clinics should start from CMOC facilities, that is from the level of a health center four. So we've had disparities across uh, teams from Zambia, Tanzania, others are suggesting should start from a regional referral, others saying at the level of a general hospital. So this is where we'll probably need a, a team of experts to decide at what level of care should uh, a pregnant mother with sickle cell disease start, I mean, attend antenatal care. But we would require where there's a, uh, multidisciplinary team, which for our level probably will be a general hospital. That is subject to discussion. So we also aim to avoid precipitating factors, uh, extreme temperatures, dehydration, overexertion, and again, emphasizing that first trimester may be challenging for those who may have uh, hypermesis gravidarum, because this will lead to dehydration and precipitate crisis. So this is just an excerpt from the ARCO guidelines what should happen at the first appointment. So you offer information, advice, and support in relation to optimizing general health. And the primary care hospital appointment, uh, you offer partner testing if it was not done during the preconception care. So you review the partner results if available and discuss possibility of prenatal diagnostics. Where, and, and we currently have this service in Uganda uh, and you decide whether to terminate or not. Um, that's subject to discussion. Take a detailed clinical history to establish extent of sickle cell disease and its complications and prepare the couple for the journey of pregnancy. Review medications and its complications. And again, if they are, they are on hydroxyurea, you want to stop them and cancel them on possible outcomes. If they're on SEEIs, uh, uh, stop them. And then, but the pregnancy should be continued. Women who should be, should be ready uh, I beg your pardon. Women should. Started in a, a preconception period and then discuss the vaccinations, uh, offer retinal and cardiac assessments if not already done in the previous one year or during preconception care, and then document all your baseline findings, including oxygen saturation and blood pressure. We know that these mothers are also at risk of developing preeclampsia. Okay, so at seven to nine weeks, you confirm viability because they are at increased risk of miscarriage. And then at, uh, at the booking appointment, also discuss information, education, and this is really about crisis prevention. Okay, so at 16 weeks, can be seen by a midwife, but also if that multidisciplinary team is available, 
can review at 20 weeks can be seen by a midwife plus multidisciplinary team. Again, you're doing a detailed ultrasound scan uh, and then you repeat midstream urine assessment, looking at proteins and also trying to rule out development of preeclampsia and then you do a, a full a, a CBC. At 24 weeks, so one of the things we are trying to harmonize in the guideline uh, is to increase the frequency of seeing these mothers in antenatal care so that we mitigate any risks that develop. So the, the guideline that is yet to come suggests that in the first, uh, first trimester, we see them monthly, the first two trimesters, they are seen monthly, and then in the second, uh, second and third, they are seen every two weeks. Uh, but also tailored to the woman's needs. And, and each time they come, you have to do the routine checks, the blood pressure and the urinalysis. So this is just about the antenatal growth monitoring time. Around 36 weeks, you start discussing about the timing and mode of delivery, uh, issues of analgesia, which we're going to look, about, look at in the intrapartum care, but also care of the baby at birth. Uh, delivery, currently the recommendation is it should be done between 38 uh, to 40 weeks, which is what we're going to look at. So what, should the woman develop pain crisis during antenatal, you avoid, first of all, you want to avoid precipitants, but in case they develop, uh, you offer fluids, 60 mils per kilogram in for 24 hours, and you take caution of risk of overload in cases of preeclampsia. Uh, oxygen, also of analgesics. You really follow the WHO uh, analgesic ladder, but talk, take caution that NSAIDs should only be given between 12 to 28 weeks. And uh, for severe pain, you can give morphine. Now we want to avoid pethidine because it already, it has a risk of seizures and yet these same mothers are at risk of developing preeclampsia and, and all the other complications. So for any woman that gets admitted because they are at risk of DVT, uh, during antenatal, they should be offered thromboprophylaxis uh, using low molecular weight heparin. Uh, transfusion is recommended if the HB is less than six, less than or equal to six milligrams per deciliter, or if there's a fall of more than two, gra two grams per deciliter from the baseline. And that is really if you took uh, the baseline CBC, as we already noted in the antenatal. And you can read more about this transfusion protocol from the TAPS trial. Um, there's uh, the TAPS trial tries to discuss prophylaxis transfusion versus acute, uh, uh, and you can find out more about what these two terms mean in patients with sickle cell disease. Okay, so the outline of pain management you require to do um, rapid assessment. If pain is severe or is not severe, you can do oral analgesics. But if it's not effective, you go for the strong opioids and specifically the morphine. Um, but you can also add uh, paracetamol or an NSAID if they're between 12 to 28 weeks. Uh, where need be, you may prescribe uh, laxatives, especially if they're taking the, the oral morphine. Monitor pain. Uh, again, you don't want them to, to have severe vomiting, so you may prescribe an antimetic because you don't want to predispose them to dehydration. So monitor pain, sedation, vital signs, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation every 20 to 30 minutes until pain is controlled and, and they are stable. And then every two hours, uh, if receiving parental opiates. Give a ref you can give rescue doses of analgesia if required, and then you monitor re respiratory rate. And then you consider tapering down the dose oral doses of an analgesia, and then you follow up with your two weekly appointment. So in women who have hip replacements, it is important to discuss about delivery and the suitable positions. We know that most of our health workers are comfortable with women delivering in dorsal position, but you need to discuss um, suitable positions for, for the woman. So there are no randomized control trials to dictate appropriate timing of delivery, but consensus is around 38 uh, to 40 weeks uh, have had better outcomes and uh, prevent late pregnancy complications, especially perinatal deaths. So in the intrapartum care, 
the timing of delivery between 38 to 40, as already mentioned. Mode of delivery is vaginal unless you have other obstetric indications for C-sections. This has been an area of um, controversy because uh, most people say, what if the mother is in crisis? But we realize even crisis in itself is not really reason to do cesarean section. We can do pain management and uh, allow the mothers to labor and deliver. Uh, place of delivery, preferably at the hospital at the bare minimum, and should be there should be a multidisciplinary team attending to this uh, mother. Ensure there's adequate warmth, fluid management, but as part of your pain management, again, avoid pethidine. If you have a CTG, it would be better to monitor the, uh, the baby on a CTG. And uh, oxygen saturation should be monitored. And if less than 34, you should supplement with oxygen. And in case uh, you have an indication for caesarean section, then spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia is the preferred uh, type of anesthesia. There's, uh, there's something about general anesthesia uh, causing more complication that I will share. Uh, so for in the postpartum period, you need to offer this. Uh, if the partner was not tested, you need to do newborn screening. Or if the partner was a carrier, you need to do newborn screening to determine uh, the status of this baby. And uh, I think for Uganda, we are moving some significant strides. There are facilities that are already doing this newborn screening, including Kawempe National Referral and I think Mbale and, and the Ginger Regional Referral. Hopefully this can scale out. I think Lira too is doing newborn screening. In uh, ensure adequate hydration with fluid balance chart until discharge, uh, they can do oral or IV fluids. Oxygen saturation should be monitored, you should uh, offer pain control. And again, low molecular weight heparin for seven days if they've had SVD and for six weeks if they've had caesarean section. And uh, you, you need to discuss contraception and offer them contraception. Uh, taking caution not to use estrogen containing regimen because of the risk of DVT. So this is just an excerpt from the ARCO guideline. Wait, sorry. That uh, the risk of sickle cell crisis. Uh, just a second. Is increased uh, increased by twenty five percent in women uh, more following general anesthesia. And then hydration and oxygenation should be maintained and early mobilization encouraged, again, to prevent DVT. Uh, crisis should be managed as for non-pregnant women use, using the NSAIDs uh, in the postpartum period and can be used during breastfeeding. Breastfeeding should be encouraged in women with, without, as women without sickle cell disease. Just emphasis that thromboprophylaxis in the form of low molecular weight heparin is recommended. Um, recommended during antenatal period if they are hospitalized and also in the postpartum period you continue for seven days following vaginal delivery and for six weeks following cesarean section and here it's, uh, the next point is just talking about contraception and the risk of uh, dvt with estrogen containing pills so we go for progesterone containing contraceptives and i think that marks the end of the presentation i'll be able to share um the ARCO guideline and the other documents used in the Busoga Health, uh, not Busoga, Busoga Local Maternity Neonatal System Forum, which can be shared on the other forums. Um, again, to note, this week I have also been um, appointed by Ministry of Health to coordinate the Local Maternal Neonatal System Forum for Busoga on behalf of Ministry. So I'll be working with Dr. Agri Bameka uh, to ensure service delivery in the region. Thank you so much. Over to you. Dr. Namaze. Um, Jacqueline? Yes, Dr. Hello. Nure. Yes, so um, at this juncture, we, we normally go into the chat box. There are quite a number of, of questions, some that you have tackled, some that may need some further uh, discussion. We want to use this second part of the, the hour to have as much discussion because what we have learned with the forum members is that there are a lot of things that they, they need to get a few explanations. So I'll just start with the first one. 
and I think you talked about it, but you need to emphasize. One, one of the members, and that was Michael, he asked, in pregnancy during a crisis, comment on the risk-benefit ratio of NSAIDs and opioids. You have talked about it, but you can. You can just explain what would be your first choice, what would be your second choice, or can you combine both? Okay. So thank you for that question. So the risk, it's the first of all depends on the gestational age uh, and also the severity of, of the pain. So um, for pain management, we recommend the use of the WHO analgesic ladder for pain control. So for NSAIDs, uh, like already mentioned, um, you want to reserve it between, wait, just a second. You want to reserve the use, not reserve, but not risk using NSAIDs, uh, because we know the risk associated with that in pregnancy. Um, I, I let me just try to recall. Is it a patency of the doctors at users at delivery? But also we know um, NSAIDs also, especially diclofenac, causes bleeding. So we want to start with paracetamol for mild pain, and then between twelve to twenty-eight weeks we might use. Uh, I mean, we hold the use of NSAIDs, and if the pain is severe, then we can go on to use morphine. And like I already alluded to, we completely want to avoid pethidine uh, throughout pregnancy. I don't know if that answers. So thank you. And then there was also the question about pethidine and seizures. And I, I can tell you that uh, pethidine and seizures is not only limited to pregnant uh people with sickle cell disease, it's also a contraindication when you use it in people living with sickle cell disease. And basically the reason for this is that when you give someone with sickle cell disease pethidine, you find that for it to become active, it is converted to no, no pethidine. And no pethidine usually accumulates within the neural cells of people with sickle cell disease disease and it increases the risk of seizures and these seizures can be either generalized or they can be focal and for people who have a family history of seizures even a low dose of pethidine can trigger off a seizure so it's something that you will find in our Doctor. Dr. Hello. Yes, you had. Me. Okay. So sorry. So thank you about that. So I was just trying to explain um, the issue to do with pethidine and seizures. So when you give pethidine in people with sickle cell disease, and whether you're pregnant or not, it is rapidly converted into no pethidine, and no pethidine easily accumulates in the neural cells in the brain and can trigger off seizures. And these seizures can be either generalized or or focal. Now, the other thing is if there's a family history of seizures, then the threshold for seizure activity even becomes lower and it, in, it puts you at risk of, of seizures. So thank you. I, I was not aware that I had gone off, but there was a question from um, Kenneth and he was asking about the use of low molecular heparin in the postpartum period. So maybe Jacqueline, you can give a comment on that. Okay, um, I have seen a similar question also from Alex Madrid. Um, Ruth, 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 were you saying something and we hold back? I think she maybe okay. it's you, you can go on Jacqueline and we'll see if Ruth can, can join with a better network. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, Alex asked a similar question and I, I, I think it was overlooked in the presentation. The use of uh, aspirin uh, in place of low molecular weight heparin for thromboprophylaxis. Um, let me first talk about in the antenatal period, we know that sickle cell disease is um, a high risk factor for preeclampsia. It's among, it's among the high risk, fac uh, high risk factors. So actually this, uh, in the guideline, they are supposed to receive 
uh, low, dose, low dose aspirin, 150 milligrams, just like all the other patients of high risk for PET. So they're supposed to receive uh, low dose aspirin, um, 150 milligrams once a day, starting from 11 weeks, but before 16 weeks, and they continue on up to 36 weeks or 24 hours before planned delivery. So now if the patient is on aspirin, that is one area we need to discuss because we know aspirin is a thinner. Do we want to uh, administer the low molecular weight heparin? There's no consensus on that. The other drug that we give during the pregnancy, again, for sickle cell is the calcium. Now, I know in our guideline, calcium is not there for prevention of, of, of uh, preeclampsia, but in the sickle cell guideline, it has been brought up as uh, and administered because there, there's really no risk, uh, yet we have a lot of benefit associated with it. So it's actually better for risk reduction than aspirin. Now, the, the guideline also recommends it. The low molecular heparin is really for thromboprophylaxis. And in the postpartum period, if you've had SVD, it's for seven days uh, and then you stop. However, if the mother has had cesarean section, we know the risk uh, of DVT associated with the early or late mobilization of the patient. So that goes on for six weeks. Now, the choice between aspirin and uh, low molecular weight heparin, um, I haven't seen aspirin as uh, to be used for DVT prophylaxis, so I may not be able to give you a correct comment on that, but I have I've seen it uh, as for risk reduction for preeclampsia. Thank you. Um. Jacqueline, there were some ethical questions that came up uh, with regard to when can you, or what are the conditions under which you can terminate. So I don't know if you could just comment about that because in your presentation, that option did come up. Yes. So <laughs> um, when you have done pre preconception counseling and you tested the partner, and he's either a carrier or a sickler, and they decide to go ahead. Uh, and then you, they have an option of prenatal diagnostics. Now, prenatal diagnostics and termination of pregnancy has been an area of contention. But we know in the country we have uh, service, that service now available. Uh, so the decision to terminate is really, you're going to have to do couple uh, counseling and discussion um at what point to terminate but the guideline does not recommend termination at any one point even when they have conceived on the a, a seis or on hydroxyurea it just says cancel the couple but do not terminate the pregnancy so that's an area of uh, discussion with a couple and and may not be very protective by protected by the guideline we should go ahead to terminate Okay, yeah. so and then they, there was another question with regards to have you seen any surgical complications when you have a pregnant mother with sickle cell di disease? Um, I don't know what specific complication you're looking at, but uh, of course we have the general complications of mothers with sickle cell. I mean, uh, in so all surgical, so surgical. Sorry, just, just to be specific surgical conditions. Maybe this is a mother with sickle cell disease with intestinal obstruction. Oh, okay. I haven't seen one, uh, but I had one challenging case in Kawempe um, who had thrombocytopenia. She was a previous scar, two previous scars, and, uh, and she could not undergo surgery because her levels of platelets were pretty low, but she induced and she had IUFD and failed to progress. It was a nightmare. Um, I will not disclose <laughs> how she was delivered, but anyway, eventually we had to augment her the two previous cars and she pushed, but it was something you don't want to face. But uh, okay. a surgical question in a sickle, I haven't come across one. Okay, so thank you. Um, there is another question, which I think you may have clarified with regards to hydroxyurea in pregnancy. I think you clearly stated that they should stop, but I think you, you could just re-emphasize that. 
So with hydroxyurea, uh, they, sh they, they should stop at least three months before conception. But uh, once, if, if because some don't do pre preconception care, so once you discover someone conceived while taking hydroxyurea, you stop the hydroxyurea and cancel them, but continue with the pregnancy. You do not terminate the pregnancy. Actually, there are studies, there are some studies that have showed uh, women who conceived on hydroxyurea had no complication in pregnancy in, in relation to adverse fetal or maternal outcomes, but they are limited. So the recommendation is for now, because they have a bit of uh, causing fetal congenital anomalies, uh, you stop three months prior to conception. Um, so thank you, Jacqueline. There is an, another question with regard to the best mode of delivery for people with sickle cell disease. Maybe you could re-emphasize uh, what would you prefer, a vaginal delivery or an alternative method? So the best mode uh, as for the current guideline is vaginal delivery. And if they're in second stage, you can expedite the vaginal delivery by offering uh, what do we call uh, assisted vaginal delivery using vacuum? But uh, the the C section is really when you have an obstetric indication, the general obstetric indications of cesarean section. Mm -hmm. So again, to emphasize that painful crisis is not an indication for mm -hmm. cesarean section. You can optimize and uh, offer pain control and allow the mothers to progress and have vaginal delivery. It has better recovery out uh, recovery period, and the mothers are able to ambulate much early, and you even keep them on uh, prophylaxis for a shorter time. So best mode vaginal delivery, unless otherwise you have an obstetric indication. And I must say the study I'm going to do is looking at some of the reasons why we offer pregnant women cesarean section because we are seeing an increasing trend of women being delivered by CS, by C-section, pre uh, pregnancy class, yet we really don't have. So those are some of the things we are going to be assessing in the study. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so thank you. Um, one other question that has come up is with regards to genetic counseling in our setting. And I think members, one thing I can tell you is that we do not have a lot of healthcare workers who are trained as genetic counselors. We do, I'll say, minimum counseling when it comes to talking to people who have the trait and those who have the disease. So genetic counseling is a gap and it's actually a speciality. And I'm happy to say that during the summer, uh, should I, or should I say during the months of May, June, July, we may have a visiting genetic counselor from the US and maybe if we discuss with the BHF team, she'll be able to present to, to the whole team. It is a whole science. People have degrees, masters and PhDs in genetic counseling. So we actually have a big gap and Tony, thank you for asking. There's a big gap in, in that area. Um, with regards to the HB levels, I think the baseline HB levels are usually the steady state. I am not aware, and Jacqueline can correct me, if we have an HP for a pregnant woman, what would be the baseline? Over to you, Jacqueline. Do okay. we have uh, a baseline HB for a pregnant woman with sickle cell disease? No, we don't. Um, uh, another so question? Yes, you go, you go ahead, please. I think someone is asking if it's mandatory to screen the baby for sickle cell disease after delivery. Uh, I think that is the direction we want to take as a country. And I must say, um, under the pediatric department, there's already a database. I think over about 3,000 to 4,000 babies screened and being followed up. Uh, so it would be nice to offer the screening uh, after delivery and they are followed up, they entered into the Sparkle database and followed up. And, uh, and partly also we want to actually enter the pregnant mothers and also start a follow up of uh, our pregnant mothers in the database so that we know exactly how many people we have with sickle cell in the country and uh, how they're accessing care and uh, any other service we could offer to them. Um, so Jacqueline, another important question in pregnant women, 
do we supplement pregnant women with iron during antenatal? What do the guidelines say about this? Okay, so I think I talked about iron in the preconception care because we know the risk of um what what do you call it uh of adverse outcomes associated with iron overload and yet we know pre uh, pregnant I mean sicklers already due to the rapid hemolysis, they are at risk of iron overload. So initially in the preconception period, one of the screening tests we do is actually to check for their iron levels. And if they are overloaded, then we have to chelate. Now during a pregnancy, uh, during antenatal, we actually supplement them with folic. I, the guideline is not stating iron supplementation because of the risk of overload. So thank you, ja Jacqueline. There was a question about uh, where is the newborn screening? And I think colleagues, the initial beginning by the Ministry of Health was looking at the high risk regions of, of the country, which were guided by the initial sickle cell study, which was done by the Ministry of Health. So you would look at the north, north central, West Nile, Karamoja, the East, uh, Teso, Bukedi, Busoga, Bugiso, Buganda, and some areas of uh, Bubunyoro. So not all places are able to benefit, but the idea is that the whole country should be able to benefit. And we're hoping to, to roll out this in almost every facility that can do DBS sampling or dry blood spot sampling. I think there's um, a question about screening method that you could highlight on at birth. So for the screening method, we use isoelectric focusing, which is done at the Central Public Health uh, Laboratory. It is, it is cheap and cost effective because you can run more than 100 samples at each run. So that is why it, it is being used. There are point of care tests that are being evaluated right now uh, as we speak in certain districts. And if they're able to live up to the sensitivity and specificity, then we'll be able to roll them out in the whole country. And you can get your results in, in 10 mi minutes right there and then. Um, thank you, Barbara. She's saying we need to advocate for premarital counseling and testing. I think this is the overall goal of the program, that everyone should be able to know their status. And if they do know their status, they will be able to make the right decisions. Uh, Dr. Akello, um, this was cardiac aspirin. I think you talked about it. That is very important. Some someone has mentioned this is long overdue. We are missing out on caring for people with sickle cell disease who are pregnant. Um, I'll briefly go over to take some questions. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, please raise your hand, and then we can take a verbal question. We have been trying to go through the chat so that we answer as much as possible. I saw a hand up, but I don't know if it's still there. So as we're There's waiting, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Kakabuero, please uh, unmute and ask your question. And as you're asking, uh, Dr. Jacqueline, how many pregnancies can a mother with sickle cell disease have? So you answer that immediately <laughs> after Dr. Kakabuero's question. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akero and Dr. Munube. Can, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, it was uh, quite a very good uh, presentation, and thank you for moderating. I actually just wanted to make some comments and then also give you the feedback on patients that I've actually received at Blago and I've also managed. Uh, one of the surgical conditions, uh, or some of the surgical conditions that actually we have managed, uh, one, we have managed patients who have had uh, acute chest syndrome in the pregnancy with the sickle cell and with the pleural effusion. But there has been some pleural collections and is one of the most uncomfortable conditions to treat, especially if someone is quite having a heavy uh, pregnancy in second or third trimester. 
The other condition has been acute cholecystitis uh, with the gallstones in the gallbladder and they're quite very painful. Actually, they present with epigastric pains and you may be you may confuse it for gastritis. And then the other condition also has been um, uh, uh, tropical ulcers and they tend not to heal for a long time. So sometimes if you, you don't know how to manage them, they become a problem. And especially that's why I asked about the HB levels. If the HB levels are lower, we know that nutritionally the wounds won't heal. So it becomes a very big problem. And if the the albumin levels are the 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 uh, the, uh, the albumin level is low, it is even worse. And then the other thing, if if bilirubin is high, then the wounds also don't respond. So there are some of the surgical conditions that have become a very big challenge. And obviously DVT, because we have had patients who have been uh, brought on our thoracic and vascular ward to manage DVT, and it becomes a nightmare when to start when to start and end the blood thinner and then someone's HB is low, and then sometimes you fear in the bleeding to occur. So it becomes a very big challenge and quite stressful even to the surgeon. So thank you very much. And uh, we we are looking forward for so for so much in the region of Soga because we have a lot of sickle serin uh, in this uh, uh area. And then the other comment I wanted to make is about mm -hmm. genetic counselors. As a research regulator, uh, actually we have realized that people are doing a number of genetic uh, genetic uh, studies, but we call the genetic counselors, and it's a very huge gap. So we we call upon people to take up that opportunity when it comes, and people go and train, and they give the service. The demand is high, and you remember also we lost doctors who are sicklers, and it is of recent. So it is a very big problem. So I I, I call upon. People to stop falling in. I'm, I'm, I'm told you fall in love when you blind blindly, but when you're falling in love, please be a little awake and make a sober decision because some of these are lifelong challenges, and they will haunt you to the bone. Thank you very much. Over to you, chair and the presenter. Over to you, Dr. Munube. Dr. Munube, you're mute. And uh, Dr. Jacqueline, you're mute. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know why Dr. Munube is unable. I don't know if he's able to unmute. Um, but we yes, can... yes, yes, okay. I can. Um, so, right, so Jacqueline, yeah. sorry, my, my mic was muted. But um, did you answer the question on the number of pregnancies that they can have? Is there a, a restriction and is there any no science around it? <laughs> There's no restriction on the number of children yet. Maybe that is something subject to discussion. And I don't know how ethical it is uh, uh, about the restriction. But for now, we don't have restriction on the number of children they can have. Okay, um, so Deo, you have your hand up. Please unmute and ask your question. And I think this, this will be the last question as we come to the end of the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deo Gracious. Um, my inquiry is about um, a mother carrying a sickler or, you know, a mother having um, a fetus that is a sickler. Any complications that may present? I just want to know whether there is a possibility of identifying um, a sickler fetus in vitro, um, and 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 what are some of those complications that we can look up to, and actually um, try to, to 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 counter? Thank you. Um, Jackie, would you want to answer to that? Um. Uh, so I think. They can actually carry, and I think that's why we are off, we are talking about prenatal diagnostics because you're able to. I mean, there are facilities that are able to determine this in utero, uh, but for now I cannot say there are specific complications in pregnancy 
associated with a mother carrying a baby who is a sickler. But again, that's why we are discussing the ethical issues associated with if prenatal diagnosis is done and babies determined to be a sickler, uh, should you terminate the pregnancy? Should you continue with the pregnancy? That's for a, a, a discussion for another day, I guess, um, probably with the couple. But I've not come across the documented evidence of complications of pregnancy because the mother is carrying um, a sickler. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then let me also add to, to that. We do receive these mothers who give birth to children with sickle cell, and they're 100% normal. They have had a normal de delivery. If you go through the antenatal history during the delivery and postpartum, they have no complications completely. So th there is no difference. So even if you did a case control study looking at a mother who had a child who had sickle cell disease and one who dad does not, I'm not sure if there will be any differences, but still a very important question, and that is a study that can be done. Um, Dr. Akelo, I would ask you to answer the last two questions within the, the chat. The best analgesic during labor, I know you mentioned it, but just to emphasize, and then someone is asking, uh, how about mothers who do not get access to preconception knowledge about their pregnancy journey? And is there any special care for them post-conception? And after that, we shall close and wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Munube, and thank you, Tim, for the great discussions and deliberations. Um, I must say, uh, to look at this guideline, we'll actually have uh, a team of experts review and we are extensively what we call using the Delphi technique. It's something I'm working on. But just to answer the best analgesia uh, during labor, it's not any different from management of pain during uh, antenatal. Again, we use the, the analgesic ladder, taking into caution gestational age, but also avoiding pethidine. But what is recommended is in case of severe pain, you use morphine and then offer all the other um, fluid management, oxygen and all that. Uh, so if a mother has not had preconception care, if I remember that question right, I, I, would, I would like to reread that question about if they've not had access. Who do not get access to preconception care knowledge about their pregnancy journey? Is there any special care for them post-conception? Uh, so they receive the immediate post uh, postpartum care, of course, like for all pregnant women with sickle cell disease, the prophylaxis, uh, pain control, prevent infections, and all that. And then that is the opportunity to discuss for the to discuss with them uh, contraception and also now preparation for in case they intend to get pregnant again, they should be able to be offered preconception care and the, all the other components of preconception care. So there's no special care because you've not had preconception care. You're treated like all the other uh, pregnant women who have had who have sickle cell disease and were pregnant. But the emphasis is now to discuss the subsequent pregnancy. Can we offer you preconception care and what it entails so that we optimize outcome and make your pregnancy experience much more positive? and prevent all these complications that you may have experienced in this pregnancy. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Kelo, for the presentation. I want to thank all the colleagues and members who have joined us. I would like to invite uh, Desmond um, to run the last part of uh, our webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, once we get the visiting geneticist within Uganda, we shall be able to share with the Busoga Health Forum an opportunity to have that CME. And possibly, if she's around long enough, she could even do some trainings within the region. Thank you very much. Over to you, Desmond, and thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Dr. <clears throat> Monobe, and thank you so much, Dr. Jacqueline, for this uh, elaborate presentation. I will not go into much. 
I just want to invite Professor Peter to give some few remarks and then we'll invite Dr. Kabul to close the session by awarding certificates. Yes, Dr. Peter. Well, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Namaze, our chair for today. Uh, this is not the first time your chair presented Dr. Deo uh, for being one of the, I mean, for doing the introductions and uh, Jacqueline for uh, doing the actual presentation and uh, really getting back to many of the questions. Uh, just this evening, actually right now I'm on uh, my way to Kampala. I'm from, uh, the, today they were, I'm from Chavazinga's Palace. Uh, today the event uh, was was coming out of uh, the, the Kseng, as you can imagine. But one of the things we're talking about, and that's also guys for them to turn here this, is how can we improve health? And I think these are some of the areas that are uh, a major problem in Busoga, but also in the country. Uh, things which need special research. I was surprised when Jack said that we even don't know the prevalence of how many women who are pregnant are uh, sicklers, or what is the number of uh, sicklers who get pregnant. Um, so I think more areas of research is great that Jack is doing research on this. Dr. Kaveri talked about uh, some very interesting case studies. And uh, for me, your clinicians, one area I'm not very happy with you is that you are not uh, writing these case studies into um, uh, things that we can use to advance medicine. So Dr. Ruth Dewo, I think we need a book on sickle cell experiences from Uganda. Whatever you write will be worth the publishing. And uh, I think there is a lot you can to learn from this. And if you get any any cases, really they need to be documented. And for you guys who are lecturers, you can actually get your SHOs to write up stuff, which would be a great thing. Otherwise, they, I mean, in America, they don't have sickle cell. Okay, they have a few cases. Or oh, in, in Europe. So really, they cannot write much about this. It is us who see these cases every day. And uh, then it was interesting ab about these areas of genetic counseling, where we are even doing DNA testing and so many things, and we don't have people with expertise. Uh, so also I want to apologize that um, I think the, the, the Zoom was um, filled, I think its capacity 300. Benjamin, you need to investigate how we can expand Zoom even during a presentation. I think it's possible we can pay up money so that we don't discourage people. I would like to end by thanking you, but also uh, requesting that uh, this presentation be repeated uh, maybe next week or in a few weeks' time to give benefit to those who would like to know more or who have missed today. Over to you, uh, Dr. Kaweru, to close the session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter, and welcome back from the Chavazinga's Palace uh, for uh, Chavazinga's uh, Palace, and uh, we are hoping a lot to happen. Uh, with those few remarks, I, I would want to take opportunity on behalf of Busoga Health Forum to join our hands together and give a big clap to a Dr. Deo uh, Gracias Mnube Wisdom league at Malago and the PICS and for me, I'm in the surgical department for having able given us the introduction to sickle cell management in Uganda. And I also thank with this uh, certificate, we thank you and uh, may you come back another time. And on the same note, I would like to, uh, to appreciate Dr. Jacqueline Akero and for you, we should give you a house in Ginger. Dr. Kaweri, Dr. Kaweri is struggling with internet. So, Jacqueline, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And um, uh, you said you're going to be working with uh, the Soga Learning Platform for uh, Matan Newborn. I'll be happy to engage with you. Please look out for me or send me a message. We we work together. Please receive this certificate. Uh, next, Dr. Ruth. 
we have some unfinished agenda, me and you, <laughs> on um, uh, our, a public health approach to sickle cell. And um, our team has been reminding me, but I've been quite busy. But I'm sure I'll get back to you. And actually, Dr. Ruth, I have a partner who would like to work with you people in the sickle cell. So let's um, get in touch. Maybe that's a good reason to look for me. Uh, thank you so much, members, for coming. Um, let's, let's plan more presentation on these areas so that uh, people get to know the most recent evidence. Thank you, members. Uh, and thank you, Benjamin, for his organizing this. Thank you, Busoga Forum. Today, Busoga Forum was appreciated by the king, by the queen, and by chairperson of um, uh, the real wedding, but also with the prime minister. Have a good night. God bless. Benjamin, you may need to announce how people can access the presentation or how they can join Busoga Forum. Thank you, and bye-bye. Uh, thank, thank you, you so Peter. I, I shall look for you also. And may, maybe just to reemphasize for the members, we have posted the link for both the CPD points and also the presentation. And I'll also request uh, Desmond to just send the presentations to the e emails. Thank you. Have, right. have a good evening. Thank you so much, members, for attending. Uh, we, we are always happy to have you as Busoga at the firm. And uh, we are looking uh, forward to having more presentation of, of the kind. And uh, I would always talk to Dr. Munube to see that we have, uh, we have good presenters in this line. Thank you, Dr. Jacqueline, for preparing uh, this presentation. It was really so interesting. It has come to capacity, but most members have struggled to join. Members, you can find the, the, the presentation on our website. For those who are in the WhatsApp group, let me share it, but I'm also sharing it here in the chat. So you can share it to a friend to download.